Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. I always think that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. Hmm. Right? And so uh, the question is always how do we, uh, you know, create uh, opportunities for people uh, to do well in this world, especially young people. We typically think of success as a function of, you know, our character, our intelligence, our hard work. And what you're raising the point is that oftentimes it's not. It's a, it might be a function of say, social differences, yeah. right? Of gender, race, caste, all these things, uh, or how much money your parents have. Right. Right. And that's just not fair. For the past year at Inside IIM, we have been conducting one-on-one -on -one career coaching sessions as counsel, short domain-specific courses as masterclasses, and university-affiliated certificate programs. Now, we are extremely excited to announce that we have a new home for all these highly rated programs in altuni.in. So, if you are looking to earn a high salary, get a promotion, switch jobs, click on the link in the description or just visit altuni.in. Thank you, enjoy the video, and... Don't forget to press the bell icon to never miss an update. Cheers. Welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us. We are doing another episode of Professor of the Year, the series that we are doing with the best professors in the country from all the top B schools in the country. Today we have Professor Tarun Jain. Professor Tarun Jain is a professor of economics at IIM Ahmedabad. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Why is economics taught in an MBA? The economists tend to be the philosophers of business school, right? So uh, some of your uh, listeners might have gone to, say, engineering uh, programs. And uh, when you before you can study engineering, you sort of have to study science. Engineering is built on the principles of physics, chemistry, maths, biology, so on and so forth. So the economists are a little bit, studying economics is a little bit like that. That management principles are also a um, function of economics, psychology, statistics, and so on right. and so forth. And so um, just like you have to uh, do exercise and jogging and running before you can play sports, you have to learn economics, statistics, psychology, all these subjects before you can learn some of the more advanced uh, management subjects. But you know, despite that, I'd say that economics is very useful in terms of creating frameworks in your mind. Right. Uh, you know, your, anyone's management career can easily last 40 years. And what's fundamental has to remain in your mind, right? So economics and particularly microeconomics is very helpful in creating those frameworks. And if you can learn and master economics uh, early in your career, it's a great way to create uh, you know, long lasting managerial career. How closely correlated is a great formal education to a great career in today's times? Yeah, so that's a great question, Kunj. Um, you know, formal education has its space and most of us are always learning. So there's always this informal education that we're always going through, even after we finish our formal education. Right. Um, I think these days um, that informal post-formal post education part of training is also being captured by, say, for-profit firms offering online courses, yes. very contemporary courses, so on and so forth. So people sort of scratch their heads and say, what is this formal education good for? <laughs> right? My degrees, my campus, my you know classes, what are they good for? Right. And um, I have a perspective that there are three big things that your formal education does for you, right? Uh, first, the term structure of formal education tends to be very long. Yes. So think about your school education. How long is that going to be valuable to you? Your entire life. My entire life, yes. Right? That's So the, what you learn in school is going to be useful to you your entire life. Uh, what you learn in, say, uh, MBA or business school should at least last you your entire formal career, professional career. That's a fair but expectation. What's the value of this education? What are you getting out of it? So the first thing I think about is that, uh, you know, any formal education is going to yield frameworks. Mm. It will teach you how to think. It will not tell you what to think. It won't give you the right answer. So we can't predict what will happen 10 years from now in the industry. We can't predict what will happen 25 years from now in the industry. And what is the right answer 25 years from now? But we can help you go through how to structure problems so that even 25 years now uh, from, the, from today, you're thinking in those frameworks. These days, big data is very hot. 
what is big data based on? It's based on statistics. The core discipline is that of statistics. So in your formal education, you're forced to sort of learn statistics. I mean, I know very few people who, you know, read statistics textbooks for fun. So it's only in the formal education system that you learn statistics. And if you've mastered statistics, you'll find that big data course that you might take at job or, you know, on an online course. The first value of um, formal education, it teaches you frameworks. The second value of formal education, I always think, is the element of surprise, right? So many of us know what we want to learn and we want to get out of something out of it. And sometimes, you know, we are, you come to business school or you go to college and you learn all these things that you never realized you wanted to learn. Right. What's undergraduate or graduate education to a smaller extent allow you to do is to explore a little bit. At IMM the Bath, for example, we have one year of core classes. Professors force you to take the course uh, management disciplines, but second year you can explore. Right. And I think there's some value in that uh, in, you know, at a young age in your twenties that you figure out that you like this, but not that. Hmm. And you can do it in a relatively risk-free way. Third thing that formal education just gets you is a massive peer network, hmm. right? Um, these are your relationships. I would even say that many people will form friendships and those friendships just last you a long time. Right. And, you know, for me, um, many of my friends were those who I've made in college, in graduate school. And, you know, that has value beyond your profession. That's also your emotional strength, your buddies, your whatever you are. And uh, I think that's very valuable. There is one IMM, though, but there are maybe mm-hmm. six top IIMs. How do we ensure that it is more accessible to even the more disadvantaged communities? How do we make formal education, high quality, top quality formal education more accessible? I always think that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. Hmm. Right. And so uh, the question is always, how do we, uh, you know, create uh, opportunities for people uh, to do well in this world, especially young people? We typically think of success as a function of, you know, our character, our intelligence, our hard work. And what you're raising the point is that oftentimes it's not. It's a, it might be a function of say, social differences, yeah. right? Of gender, race, caste, all these things, uh, or how much money your parents have, right? Right, and that's just not fair. And you know, so you've talked about the expansion of the management uh, education system, the IMs. Uh, similarly, there's been a massive expansion of say um, college level education. Uh, engineering education, the IITs, have, the number of IITs have expanded, but the scale of at which any given IIT works has also expanded. And similarly, uh, IIMs are also expanding, right? So we are starting new programs. We're you know making sure that we can reach out to many different types of stakeholders. So I think that's one element of policy, right? Uh, mm-hmm. That both the government as well as all these institutions uh, work on. But actually, you know, I want to reach out to many of your audience members and make two personal points. Yes. Right? And the personal points go like this, right? So um, uh, first is that, you know, always advocate for high quality public education. So irrespective of whether you study at a public institution or a private institution, always be an advocate for high quality public education, because these are really the bedrocks of society. These are the ways in which people move up. Um, right. The uh, analogy that I would draw is that of the US education system, where you do have some elite private institutions, the Ivy League schools and so on and so forth. But really the bedrock of the US education system are the large public universities. Many of your viewers, Kunj, are going to be some of the most successful people in India. Yes. That's just a fact, right? And when you have ascended that ladder of success, you've achieved some power, influence, Please be an advocate for a cooperative society where you pull people up. Hmm. Don't, you know, I think the mantra tends to be that we are a competitive country. That's true. Yeah, because it's so difficult to get into IIMV, right? Yeah. I mean, it is a it is a zero sum game to get into an uh, IIM Ahmedabad. It is a zero sum game to get into a, a top consulting firm or an investment bank, and yeah. uh, that that becomes your orientation for the rest of your life. Yeah, uh, and so then it's to switch important back. for students to recognize that, look, we might come from a competitive system, but right. who I want to be is a different kind of person. Right. And to co- cooperate with others, to uh, be a team, uh, a team player, uh, to be public-spirited, to build people up, I think is very important. And what you'll find 
you know, if you if you become like that, what you'll find is that not only do you do better yourself, but life is also much more fun. Right. Right. So competition has its space, but once you achieve a certain amount of power and influence, you know, compete on the big stuff. Compete against COVID. <laughs> Don't compete against the guy who's sitting in the next seat. The number one thing that we do amongst at IMA and I think this is true for many other business schools as well, is to encourage students to have that perspective um, on how to bring people together right. and tackle those big problems. So, you know, when you're a student, you might feel that the number one issue is how to get my job. Uh, but that's just the problem for the next six months. Right. And what we hope is that some of the lessons that we impart, uh, you might, you know, it will click at some point. Hmm. And students will take up some of those big challenges. I think uh, when I look at IMA alumni and their achievements, my perspective is that it does click and eventually students do come around to uh, solving some of these big problems. Uh, some of them will solve it through the public sector. Some of them will solve it to the private sector, irrespective of the mechanism that they choose or which field where they do it. Uh, many of them have been extremely successful in addressing big problems. Professor, let's uh, put across this particular thing that you've also written about uh, a fair bit, mm -hmm. which is You've advocated uh, in our current uh, climate of free vaccines kind of a regime. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about why the uh, benefits far outweigh the negatives of free vaccines. So how is it the government say that is saving money in the long run by doing this? One way to think about this is, uh, you know, think about what happens when there is widespread COVID or the threat of COVID across the country. You have lockdowns, you have containment measures, you have mitigation measures. What is the cost of these things? Well, one is that you have to spend on healthcare, right? Right. But you also have to, the, the containment measures, the lockdowns themselves cause destruction to economic growth and prosperity. So I remember that, you know, in the second quarter last year, we had a 25% decline in our GDP. What is the cost of any national vaccination program? It's just in the few tens of thousands of crores. It won't be, even be 1% of GDP. So by giving people 1% of GDP, free vaccines to everyone, make sure that everyone gets covered. There is no one who decides not to get a vaccine because they had to pay for it. Right. What do you, what is the national benefit to it's, you know, many points on GDP growth. Of course, the government can always tax back. Right. That growth and easily pay for these vaccines. So it's a win-win for the government. It's a win-win for the citizens. It's a win-win for the country to have free vaccines all around. The final piece of this puzzle is the vaccine manufacturers. And right now we have two in the country, but actually, um, as we speak, many more vaccines are being approved. We can either import or manufacture those vaccines inside the country. I don't think there's any problem. Um, the government, uh, ideally, I would like the central government to be, uh, you know, striking deals with the vaccine manufacturers. Hmm. Uh, that allows them to be a monopsony, uh, which is a single buyer, and therefore get a better price for the national exchequer. So that way we've lowered the price of actually buying. But right. if we have multiple entities, say state governments or private hospitals also buying uh, vaccines, it just means that the cost to those state hospitals, state governments or hospitals is going to be higher. And therefore, right. manu vaccine manufacturers are just going to make much more money. Professor, this has also brought to the uh, surface a certain uh, inefficiency or just having a very lackadaisical uh, healthcare system in our country. Mm -hmm. And it has come to the fore because of COVID. How do you go about repairing this? How do you go about fixing this so that, you know, we don't get such kind of a shock the next time around? There's a common misperception that healthcare expenditure is a cost. Hmm. I never think of healthcare expenditure as a cost. I always think of it as an investment. Oftentimes the cost of that investment is very low, but the returns are throughout the life of that kid. Right. If I think about, you know, say polio er eradication, the benefits to the country from not having polio are truly very high. And right. those returns not only accrue to the citizens, but also to the government, because all those individuals who did not have polio are going to be much more productive, higher income, and therefore going to have, you know, much, much more uh, useful lives, which the government can then tax back also. If I was a, a state uh, finance minister, or if I was Nirmala Sitaraman, I would advise mm. that put a lot of money into healthcare, uh, 
in, because it's a very high return investment for the country that is going to have benefits for the long run. From the perspective of private firms also, I would say that um, it's important to invest in the health of your employees. The fact right. is that you're paying them so much that it's worth it to invest in their health so that they don't get fall sick. And many firms, I think, instinctively realize that there are many wellness programs. Uh, in this time of COVID, I would easily tell all my, you know, all the corporate recruiters who are watching this video is to please go out and, you know, pay for the best quality vaccines for your employees as soon as you can, because those returns are going to be high. When we build back our healthcare system, I, I would also like there to be two additional points. So one is that of uh, healthcare research. I think uh, many of your viewers who have been watching the news have suddenly learned about this, you know, healthcare research infrastructure that we have in, say, virology, in immunology, you know, immunology yes. uh, cellular biology, so on and so forth. Um, and the people who are in our healthcare research infrastructure are actually very talented, right? So I have a lot of respect for the scientists who are mm. uh, in all these institutions. There just aren't enough of them. Mm. Right, And so we have to expand our healthcare research infrastructure so that we have much more expertise within the country. And we're not necessarily relying only on uh, Center for Disease Control or National Institutes of Health in the US or experts in UK or Germany to advise us. We need many more experts in India. Uh, you know, the uh, analogy that I draw is that any Indian state is as large as at least one European country. Right. Right. And we need expertise and infrastructure to correspond to that. All right. Thanks a lot, Professor. This was very enlightening. Got to know a lot about, uh, you know, the world we live in and mm -hmm. what is it that you're doing at IMA to prepare students for the world that they are entering. Thank you so much for your time. Congratulations again for winning Professor of the Year at Inside IIM. We wish you all the best for the coming year. Hopefully you will be reunited with your students soon and you can uh, again teach them in a classroom and then walk with them at Vikan Plaza. Thank you so much, Professor. That's my dream as well, Kunj. Thank you so much for having me.